and I'm going to read from verse 12 uh, through to verse 20, yes, 20, and then the last three verses uh, of the chapter, uh, because what I've got to say fits in. That that's the conclusion of the chapter, really, but only preaching part of the chapter. So, Isaiah 40 at verse 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, or with the breadth of his hand marked, out, marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket, or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance? Who has instructed the mind of the Lord or instructed him as his counsellor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him and who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him the knowledge or showed him the path of understanding? Surely the nations are like a drop in a bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. Lebanon is not sufficient for altar fires, nor its animals for burnt offerings. Before him all the nations are as nothing. They are regarded by him as worthless and less than nothing. To whom then will you compare God? What image will you compare him to? As for an idol, a craftsman casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold, and fashions silver chains for it. A man too poor to present such an offering selects wood that will not rot. He looks for a skilled craftsman to set up an idol that will not topple. And we turn over to verse 29 and read to the end of the chapter. Or oh, verse 28. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Uh, I, before I come to the word, a couple of things to bring you greetings from Alton Park Baptist Church. Um, and I'm back here, I think, in a fortnight's time. That's right. Yes, Dave is nodding. That's good. We're on the same page here. And um, I won't be going desperately quickly, but I will be shooting off reasonably early because I have to pick up Rose from our church uh, because we're going out to uh, someone we've known for many years and someone else is giving her a birthday lunch for her 87th, we think, birthday. Uh, so I've got to get to Southport uh, so via Orton but I will be able to have a quick cup of coffee and, and say hello to people and, and then depart off. And I should see you again in two weeks' time, when as far as I know, there is no 87th birthday party that I have to get to. Let's turn to God's word. And Isaiah 40, and I was here a little while back, and I said that I would uh, bring to you, uh, we, we looked at the first uh, tw 11 verses over a couple of weeks, and I said I would carry on with this great chapter. Uh, and this week and next, really, I want to uh, look at most of it, uh, but the conclusion, though I will mention that each time, which we read also from those last few verses, I'm hoping to look at in more detail. Uh, I think the next time I'm booked to come to you is in January, and the first Sunday in January, and so I hope to look at it then at the beginning of a new year. I thought those last few verses of Isaiah 40 uh, are very fitting those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength uh, and those verses around that. Um, and just to say, yes, um, I didn't know it's harvest. I rang Dave up and said, is it harvest? I, I was picking hymns. And he said, ah, oh, I should have told you. So I said, well, that's easy. I know what it's easy. It makes it easier for the choosing of the hymns. And in fact, this passage, without straining it, uh, I will be mentioning harvest three times, uh, if not before, if not more. What is Isaiah 40 about? Well, it's about comfort. There it is at the beginning. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. The comfort of God's promises, and those promises are there in verses 2 to 11, which culminate in the coming of Christ, uh, the good shepherd, to gather his sheep uh, to himself. 
But receiving the comfort of God's promises here as always depends on two things at least. It depends on believing God can do all he promises and that he will do what is wise and good and right. We know in human terms, you know, people might make you promises and sadly sometimes you have to learn that you just can't believe a word they say. For one reason or another, they don't do what they say. And anyway, a human promise can be for to do something that's wrong or unwise at least. Never with Almighty God. Look at the structure of this chapter just to show what I'm doing. Verse 12, you start this, who has measured the waters? And it leads on to verse 18, having spoken about that, uh, of this is God, the creator, to whom then will you compare God? And it's verses 12 to 20, which follows from there from verse 18, I want to look at this morning. Uh, and then next time, God willing, do you not know? Another question, have you not heard? Verse 21, which leads again to a to whom then? In verse 25, to whom will you compare me? The same conclusion. Verses 12 to 17, and then to whom will you compare God? Verses uh, 21 on to 24, to whom then will you compare me? But each time I want to look at this concluding promise from verse 29 briefly, and then as I say on its own more in January. So let's go straight in. Verse 12, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance? The answer, of course, is God has and no one else. God alone is the creator. We're going to learn much about God from this passage. And this is the first thing we learn of his omnipotence, that he is the all-powerful God, that he is the one who is, as he's pictured here, as a careful, not only architect, who is measuring things off, but he is his own quantity surveyor because he's weighing the mountains. He, he gets exactly the right amount of material to make exactly what he wants to do. If you have builders, they've got to be very good if they don't have a bit left over or a bit short. Uh, and if they build the building exactly according to the plans, well, all I can say is every building I've ever been into must have plans where it shows that the corners are not right angles because I've never found a building where all the corners are right angles. But God's right angles are right angles. He doesn't make mistakes. It's all been planned in advance. That's the point, isn't it? He's not, uh, he's not like a cowboy builder. Oh, well, I'm not sure what to do about this. Let's try it this way. Because he is, as the verses go on to say, all wise. Who has understood the mind of the Lord or instructed him as his counsellor? No one. Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him? Who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge or showed him the path of understanding? When you want a human builder, you actually do want someone who has been taught how to do it by someone who knows what he's talking about. Apprenticeships are a good idea, you know. But God has no, he's not anyone's apprentice, is he? He is all wise. And only he is all wise. Uh, quite a few verses, not many this week, and just as well because I don't think you've ever turned over the pages of this Bible, so it's a bit hard to turn them over, uh, where it says that right at the end of Romans, the last verse, it speaks of, Paul says, to the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. God is all wise, perfectly wise. So he planned this intricate working creation and he planned it alone. And he is the Lord. That's the title given him here. And you remember what that means. He is the eternal God. He is the God who is before his creation. He is a God who has a, a spirit. We meant, that's spoken of uh, it here. Um, uh, in, it was spoken of in, the pas in, in what I had. Uh, in the version I had. It's not here. But he has a spirit and he has a son. And we learn that later on, certainly on the way through Isaiah and through the rest of the scripture. He is the triune God. You see, this is Isaiah is building up a picture of who God is. All powerful, all wise, eternal, triune. And go back to verse 13. Then no one taught him. No one instructed him. He didn't consult anyone. He is self-sufficient. He doesn't need 
an advisor. He doesn't need a committee to do to plan the work and then he carries it out. He is the self-sufficient God. And then we go on, who is it that taught him knowledge for end of verse 14 or showed him the path of understanding? No one else has wisdom and knowledge enough to do what is right as well as what works. The, who taught him the right way? God is righteous. His creation is righteous as it came forth from his hand. He, he, he works on the basis of principle. What is the best creation? What is, how should it be? Very good. He's, he's not a pragmatist making it up as he goes along. He has produced a creation which is ruled righteously by him. It has laws built into it which make it keep going, though God is always in control and he can intervene in miracles when he chooses. But, but he has these marvellous laws which make everything interact together intricately. And he's done it right. And the end result, as has often been said, is what even the unbelievers uh, would call a Goldilocks planet. You know, not just too hot, not just too cold, right in the middle. Uh, I'm not a scientist, but you can look these things up for yourself as well as I can. But the 23 and a half degree angle that the Earth is tilted at, which produces the seasons, uh, uh, is, is just right. It was too more, too much more or less you couldn't have. Even the atheists would say, life on earth. The distance from the sun, just right. The, the air we breathe, the mixture of oxygen which we need and, and hydrogen, which most of the air you're breathing in is an inert gas, but it needs to be there. If it was all oxygen, it would poison us. All these things. And what do they produce? They produce what you look out at the... can't see much out of here. I can see a few trees. But you go out into the countryside and there it is. There is the harvest. Most of it is in this year. We've had a good harvest in many ways. Praise God. And it produces abundance of fruit and food for man and food for animals which man can then eat. And, and all the teeming life on earth. Scripture uses that phrase elsewhere. And it's all because God has made this world exactly right. Which is why, again, the atheists will say, well, you know, it's such a, such a small chance of that happening. There must be perhaps many universes where it went wrong or something. That, how do you, it, 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 it's impossible to believe that. How much blind faith is needed to believe that this world came about by blind chance? It, it's an unbelievable thing, if you know anything. Not just the earth, the universe, the, the law of gravity. Every body in this universe attracts other bodies in relation to its size and, and its mass. No one can understand how that works. The speed of light is just right. It's not just a Goldilocks planet, it's a Goldilocks universe. And so we are not surprised when we have harvests and we have enough to eat. We shouldn't be. God made it that way. But he also superintends it. He rules over it in his omnipotence and his wisdom to make harvests come and when he chooses they don't come. Because he just tweaks the weather so slightly and you get a flood or you get a drought or you get a something else and it's all in God's hands. So why is it raining today? Because God has ordained it. And when you start saying, well, why is it raining today? What's the purpose of it raining today? Haven't we had enough rain? God has his purposes. Sometimes, of course, we can see that. Here we are, we want to go on holiday for a fortnight uh, in the middle of a drought, and we say, uh, do we pray, Lord, give us good weather? We think, actually, no, we need a deluge for a fortnight for that, save the harvest. What do you pray then? Well, you pray for other people, not yourself. But the point is, we can say, you can look at all this and you can, if you try very hard, say, it must have just happened like this. Or you can believe God's word and you say, actually, yes, it makes much, much more sense. That an omnipotent, all-wise, eternal, triune, self-sufficient, righteous God has provided our harvest today. Because he has made the world perfect for us to live in. 
So that's the who has. Secondly, we come on to behold. This will be, that was slightly a longer point. Three points in the conclusion. That behold, verses 15 to 17. Or oh, surely, it says here, the nations are like a drop in a bucket. Behold, it should be. The nations are like a drop in a bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. This is talking physically here. Verse 17, you get down to peoples. But this is physical. God is saying the nations are like a drop in a bucket. He, but it means in the context, regarded as dust on the scales, the islands as though they were fine dust. It, 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 he's the one who's measured the way the mountains, verse 12, on the scales and the hills in a balance. It's talking physically. It's saying you look at this vast land mass and it's nothing to God. He made it all by a word. But you can take it as people, can't you? That people are nothing compared with God. There is the creature-creator divide. Listening to someone the other day who switched on the radio, it wasn't meaning to listen to them, got this person about Buddhism and all about, you know, it's all, everything is everything kind of thing. And you think it's absolutely the complete opposite, isn't it? God is transcendent. God is above his creation. God has made his creation. This is what the pagans who turn away from God always struggle with, isn't it? They want a God, but their God is always too small. The Romans, the Greeks, they had these ideas of gods as just more powerful humans, not better humans, because many of them, according to their tales, are really nasty people. But they weren't people, they're gods. They're in charge of us. And then you're in the hands of these nasty people who are bigger than you are. The word for that in today is a bully, isn't it? And it just leads to hopelessness. As it did, their religions produced no hope. But we believe in a God who is above all, because, and was there first, eternally, and has made all. And then we start getting ourselves in right perspective. Who am I? Well... Add us all together, we're like a drop in a bucket and dust on the scales. Which means, verse 16, Lebanon is not sufficient for altar fires, nor its animals enough for burnt offerings. No worship by humans fully satisfies the worth of God. God's glory is far bigger than all the worship of all his people put together. Remember Isaiah's already had that vision, hasn't he? Isaiah 6 and verse 3 and he saw the Lord lifted up in his temple and the seraphim calling, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of your glory. And before we move further than that, again, think of harvest again. No worship by humans fully satisfies his worth because here are all the animals on the Lebanon mountains, it's saying, and if we could take them all and sacrifice them, it wouldn't be enough to worship God. Why? Well, he has made them all. And that brings us to think, doesn't it, as an aside really this morning, but of animals, they too are part of the harvest. We mustn't limit the harvest. I mean, when, when we have a harvest display, <coughs> we tend to use fruit and vegetables for understandable reasons uh, because we're not going to come and try and lay a sheep here and make it keep still for an hour. And if it was dead, we'd probably put us off. But... Animals are as much a harvest as plants too. And there's a great movement, isn't there, in, in the West, I don't think in much of the world, to try and sort of deny that and say you mustn't eat animals. No, animals are part of God's harvest. He provided them. The cattle on a thousand hills are his. And he's provided them for man. But come back to what is being said here. If no worship by humans fully satisfies the worth and the glory of God. How much less that by sinful humans who are seeking to make burnt offerings and propitiate God by sacrifice. Now God instituted sacrifices in the Old Testament and he told people to bring certain animals at certain times in certain ways to worship him. But his word tells us clearly that the law under which that was made was only a shadow of the good things that are coming. This is Hebrews 10. Not the realities themselves. For this reason it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly, year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. <coughs> if it could, would they not have stopped being offered? 
The logic is impeccable, isn't it? For the worshippers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder, he's talking of the Day of Atonement, are an annual reminder of sins because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. What's the answer? Christ came, that's how he goes on. And he came to do God's will and to die as the sacrifice. God's, even God's appointed sacrifices could not take away sin. But our worship is acceptable when we bring it through faith in Christ. And it is considered full. Lebanon's not sufficient. Its animals are not sufficient for burnt offerings. We have one offering for sin, an all-sufficient sacrifice. And therefore, if we come through Christ, who offered himself in that way, then God accepts our worship. It is considered full because Christ is the one who is the fullness of all. And it's not us we bring as our worship. It's Christ we bring as our offering in worship. And we come and meet in his name and say, Lord, we come because of his death. We come claiming his merits. We come to worship you because of him and in him. And then go on to verse 17. Before him all the nations are as nothing. They are regarded by him as worthless and less than nothing. We can take this word nations in a different way too, can't we? We can take it as the nations working together. And what happens when the nations work together? Well, you find that, don't you? You get the Tower of Babel. And what happens when the Tower of Babel is being built? God comes and destroys it. What you get when the nations work together is Babel and defeat for the nations who work together. Today there are vast conglomerations of nations work, trying to work together for things. To produce an agenda and increasingly becomes evident it is a very sinful agenda. The United Nations were, says you shouldn't give aid to any country which won't support the right of abortion. You see, the nations work together. The United Nations was a good organisation when it was set up because it was the nations who were united fighting Hitler and the Japanese. But look where it's gone now. Look at the things it promotes. It is one of the forefront of promoting abortion and transgenderism and everything. World Economic Forum, World Health Organisation, look at them. And they've all been captured by, by those who are completely atheistic an anti-Christian. But God says of them, and we think they're powerful. No, they're regarded as worthless and less than nothing. They will be smashed when God decides, either at the coming of Christ or beforehand. Indeed, the United Nations has shown, hasn't it, now in Russia on the Security Council, it can't possibly act. It is completely paralysed about the Ukraine war. Because the assumption is we're all on the same side. When you find you're on different sides, nothing happens. But God is omnipotent. God is all wise. God is in control. God is sovereign. God can be trusted, which we'll come to in a moment. And then there's a third question. Who has measured the waters? Verse 12. And behold, the nation's like a dust in a drop in a bucket. And then you have this to whom then. As I said, there are two to whom thens in this chapter. They, 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 they sum up what's gone before. To whom then will you compare God? In the light of everything above, how can you think of anything, any being, that is even comparable to this God? I don't just mean nearly the same. I mean able to be compared at all. There, there is no one, you can't say there's anyone in something like the same category. As we, we talked of the gods of the nations, haven't we? And, and they're just nothing like this God. And you talk of, of, of other gods and they're nothing like this God. And Isaiah goes on to say, To whom then will you compare God? What image will you compare him to? You see, people make images, don't they? They make idols. Interesting, isn't it, that the prohibition in the Ten Commandments about idols is not just that you don't worship them, it's you don't make them. <clears throat> it's no good saying to God, oh, I don't worship idols, I just make them to sell them for other people. It, it, don't, it won't wash. It's still sin. 
But idols are meant to be likenesses of God, which can represent God. And the idea behind idolatry is this. The God will look down from whatever heaven he is in, and he will see this idol, and he will say, hey, that's a pretty good representation of me. And I like that person who made that and is worshipping that. Uh, I'm pleased with them. And so I'm going to act on their behalf. And I will give them things which I will withhold from others. And that is the whole concept of idolatry. Make an idol, worship the idol. You don't really worship the idol. You're meant to be worshipping the God whose image it is through the idol and then God will be pleased to you. See how, how it's a corruption. We worship Christ who is made in the image of God. We worship the Father through Christ whose image he is. And God is pleased with us. Idolatry, there's Christianity and there's idolatry and there are parallels. But they lead to different gods and only one of them exists. And that's the problem for the idolater. All man's idols are nothing. That's what he said here. What image will you compare him to? As for the idol, a craftsman casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and fashions silver chains for it. They're man-made and lifeless. They can't even help themselves. And this is relevant particularly, uh, for, it's relevant for us at Harvest because of the situation of Israel. You remember, what is the main problem that Israel had after they went into the land? What was the main sin? The sin was the sin of idolatry. Who did they mostly worship? They worshipped Baal. Who was Baal? Baal was a fertility god. And the pagan nations who invented Baal said, let's have a god which means that if we have lots of sexual activity, our God will be pleased with us and give us harvest. It's a very convenient religion if you want to indulge in immorality. But Baal doesn't exist. And as they had food, it wasn't coming from Baal, though they thought it was. It was still coming from the Lord. Because the idol, well, he, he made it. And why have you made this expensive idol? overlaid with gold by a goldsmith and silver chains holding it up. Well, because you're saying, oh, we've got to spend some money on this. If we just make something really cheap and shoddy, the God who's in heaven won't be pleased with us. And you see what that's saying? It's saying, <laughs> you know, God is, the, these pagan gods, they're just like us really, only bigger. You know, if you give someone a present and, and you've obviously spent a lot of time and effort in making it, you know, children come home from school, don't they? And they make, uh, they brought their woodwork with them or whatever and, and the parent says, oh, how great it is, even if it's not very, because they love their child and they don't want... But, but basically, if you or I went out and bought something, someone for a birthday present, you came back and said, well, look, I know it was a bit battered and it was the last one left in the shop and it's fallen to pieces, but I got it for you anyway. You, were, you were, might, I don't know what you'd say, but I know what you'd think. you think, couldn't you have gone somewhere else and got me something a bit better? Is that what you think of me? And so that's what they think, you see. They think their God is going to be pleased by gold and silver. But God has made the gold and the silver. And if you can't afford gold and silver, verse 20, a man too poor to present such an offering, well, what does he do? He selects wood that will not rot. He looks for a skilled craftsman to set up an idol that will not topple. He can't afford gold and silver, but he, he selects good wood and he looks for a good carpenter to make it. He does his best. He spends as much as he can. All idols are made as expensively as possible and as carefully as possible. That's what Isaiah is saying. And you set them up so they don't wobble because that's good craftsmanship. But it shows the uselessness of the idol, doesn't it? If they can't even wobble, they can't move at all. If they can't move at all, they can't do anything. Remember how the psalmist puts it, Psalm 46 and verses 5 to 7. Not Psalm 46, sorry, this is Isaiah. It's Isaiah who, again, later on, Isaiah 46 and verses 5 to 7, where he says, To whom then, here it is again, will you compare me or count me equal? To whom then will you liken me, says God, that we may be compared? Some pour out gold from their bags and weigh out silver on the scales. You see a parallel passage, but it goes to a different place. They hire a goldsmith to make it into a god and they bow down and worship it. 
They lift it to their shoulders and carry it. They set it up in its place and there it stands. From that spot it cannot move. Though one cries out to it, it does not answer. It cannot save him from his troubles. How do you know your idol can't do anything for you because you can't even move about? If you could get an idol that could move itself around, you might start thinking, hey, there's a bit of power here. But if your idol has to stay where you plonk it, it can't help you. And here we have God, then, is the living God. That's the contrast here. We've looked at much about God, haven't we? We've seen how he is omnipotent and all-wise and eternal and right and triune and self-sufficient and transcendent and glorious. He is alive and the idols are dead. That's the point. And that is, well, there's many conclusions we could draw from that, isn't there? One of them, of course, this morning, again, about harvest. And we must make sure that the God we thank for the harvest is the true God. He is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who has not only given us harvests, he has given us his Son to die for our sins and his Holy Spirit to work in our hearts to bring us to himself. And that is the worshipper that God seeks, those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. And who won't just say, I'm going to try and find a God who gives me more to eat. Which is a sort of pagan idea, isn't it? The, God, the one who will say with Habakkuk, even though there's nothing in the fields, I will rejoice in the Lord. We mustn't bring God down to our own level. We mustn't say, I'm pleased with God while he does the things I want him to. And when he doesn't, I'm not pleased with him. We have to avoid that. But the lesson I want to draw out, because Isaiah does, is very, very briefly, don't worry, a couple of minutes, from those last few verses, where it says that he is the one who gives strength to the weary. And those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. As I say, I want to say much more about that somewhere down the line. But it's the conclusion of this, isn't it? God is not only transcendent and infinite, he is an imminent God, not just a transcendent God. He is a loving God. He is a God who works in power within us, not just in his power. He is the God who does what those marvellous words are that Paul says in Ephesians 3, where he says, To him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power, that is at work within us. We know God has all power, if we're Christians. What we forget is, he can do more than we ask or imagine within us to change us, to sanctify us, to him be glory in the church, to preserve us, to bring us safe. He works within us. He can strengthen you this morning to go through. It's not physical strength, this is it. Spiritual strength to go through the problems. You can have someone lying on their deathbed who can't move their arms or legs. But God has not failed this promise because they have to be strengthened within. If they're unable to die saying, hallelujah, that I'm trusting in Christ, even if they can't say it, God has fulfilled his promise. He gives us strength for today as well as bright hope for tomorrow as we have sung. And we need to expect this in Christ. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we need to expect all needed help from the loving Father. He tells us to seek him. He tells us to ask for his spirit at work. He tells us to ask for wisdom. He tells us that he'll provide grace. He keeps telling us and promising us we need to believe the promises. And as we look at the harvest, we need to say, God is a God who can do anything and does do what he's promised. And we can take that message away, not just on a harvest Sunday, but every Lord's Day and every moment of every day. Yes, amen. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that you are such a God. And you have revealed yourself. And we thank you for your